Hello, this is Zsófi Ter, the feminist podcast of Partizan, an independent online Hungarian media channel. My name is Zsófi Balog. I'm recording this episode in London, and my guest today is Kate Harris, co-founder of LGB Alliance, a charity organization formed in 2019 to support the rights of lesbian, gay, and bisexual people. Kate has a background in the women's liberation movement. She also worked in the corporate sector, during which time she got closely involved with the UK-based charity Stonewall, named after the Stonewall riots in New York, which were the start of the international gay liberation movement. Kate left Stonewall when she noticed the shift inside the organization's approach regarding gay rights. She and Bev Jackson founded LGB Alliance, which is now a global network to provide support and community to men and women who are same-sex attracted. Our international listeners, welcome to Partizan's podcast channel. You can find out more about us on our YouTube and social media platforms. And if you can, please support our work through our Patreon. Thank you for making time to talk to me. I'm absolutely thrilled to be here, Jofi. Thank you for inviting me. So we are at the end of October. This will go out in a couple of weeks. We are two days before the LGB Alliance conference, um, which will be your main annual event. Uh, And before we get to uh, the Alliance's work and what's happening currently, I'm really interested in your history in the women's movement and the gay rights movement. So how did you get involved and when and what is your story? Okay. I got involved very early on, I think because I was largely brought up by very strong women, Um, mothers, grandmother, well, mother, I should say, (laughs) grandmother, great aunt, etc, etc. I had the great good fortune to go to a girls boarding school. Um, And that was the best time of my life. I know people have different experiences. Uh, For me, it was just fantastic. Um, Lots of sport, lots of fun, lots of girlfriends. And uh, I'm still friends with people from those days. I went to boarding school when I was just nine and I left when I was 17. Um, I would say the next most influential thing in shaping my thinking was I took a year out, a gap year, And um, actually, I worked in a mental hospital, didn't know what to do. So I was uh, working in a mental hospital, saved up enough money to take three months off in America. And in those days, it was very, very uh, common to use college ride boards to travel. So you'd go to uh, any college and there'd be, you know, I'm going to Chicago tomorrow. Let's share the petrol and the driving. And in one of my rides across the U.S. and back, I was traveling with a woman who was just leaving her husband um, and in the car, which was a VW Beetle, we did about 1500 miles in it, she had our bodies ourselves by the Boston Women's Health Collective. And when I wasn't driving, I read this from cover to cover and that was it. Hundreds of pennies dropped. I came back to the UK, went to university, um, rapidly got involved in the Women's Liberation Group. and the rest is history. Brighton at that time uh, was a really lively women's community. We set up the Women's Centre, um, which was interesting because it was a grouping of the Women's International League for Peace and Freedom. When was this? This was 1973, no, something like that. Um, Three groups were involved, Women's International League for Peace and Freedom, which was set up after the First World War, United Nations organization, and included in that were quite a few women whose families had fled Nazi Germany. Um, There was also a Young Wives Network, and then there was the Women's Liberation Group, and we all worked together to set up a women's centre. Now, at that time, the women's centre was for women. And we did pregnancy testing free. And we gave, you know, we listened to people. We had social, uh, walk-in coffee, walk-in pregnancy tests, talking information. I'm horrified to see that today Brighton Women's Centre says on its website, Brighton Women's Centre always welcomed anyone who identified as a woman. This is one of the things that all of us loathe. Everybody loathes having their history rewritten. So um, I can tell you that in the 70s, (laughs) this was very much a women's 
place where women shared ideas, different age groups, different backgrounds. We learned from each other. We shared. We argued. God, did we argue. And the lesbians became um, um, more and more visible, more and more vocal. And the lesbians really uh, went on. I think we, we can say that it was the lesbians who formed Brighton Women's Aid. And I was part of that. So that was a refuge for women escaping um, male violence. And uh, after I left university, I worked there. Uh, that was that was fantastic. In those days, you could, we used to call it signing on, which meant you had to go each week to the Department of Employment, stand in a queue, sign on. They would send you £15 a week or whatever, which was enough to live on. And you could work full time as a volunteer without without mentioning it. We, we, we just said we were unemployed, but we were fully employed at Women's Aid. And that was the same across the UK. Loads and loads of women were setting up refuges all over the country with no official backing, no money, no investment. But we, in a way, we thought the state should be paying for this so the state can pay us <laughs> and um, after two or three years, I mean, that, that was a, a very busy time. It, it introduced me to, to the sort of legal system, to how women were treated by the Department of Housing, how they were treated in the law courts. It was a great introduction to adult life, I would say. And then uh, suddenly we got paid. We became an official organisation. The council decided to pay us. Um, and at that stage, I think I left. <laughs> I think at that point, we sort of became rather under the control of the people who were paying the salaries. Mm -hmm. And then I went on and did all sorts of things. Um, and I ended up working at American Express. I never you know, stopped campaigning. I've never been a lesbian who's in. I, I'm not quite sure why, but I've, I've never had to come out. Maybe it's because it's screamingly obvious. <laughs> um, but... In every job I've had, whether it I worked at Brighton Centre, which is still there, I worked in a travel agents in Brighton, I worked all over the place, restaurants, all like like anybody, but it never occurred to me to not talk about my girlfriend or my social life. Um, I maybe it's because I'm a very simple person and I'm not very good at managing a double life. And uh, then I emigrated to New Zealand. I uh, had a little bit of a dip, I suppose, in my political activities as we settled into New Zealand. Um, and that's how I got involved with American Express. And gradually I bounced back here with my Kiwi partner, who um, became involved through her work with Stonewall. And uh, that's how I got involved with Stonewall. We were, we were absolutely dedicated as an example for our civil partnership. We said, no presents, please give donations to Stonewall. And in those days, Stonewall was a pioneering organisation that could be relied upon to use facts. This um, is in the 90s? Uh, probably. Early 90s? I don't know. I yeah. just know that Stonewall was uh, founded yeah, in the 90s and early 2000s. Mm -hmm. Um, and it, 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 there was a sense of community, although it was male dominated. And part of my function, ironically, was to get more lesbians to support Stonewall, which I did. We had a, a dining club called the Violin Girls. Um, and I, I was a Stonewall ambassador, very happy. Um, and we used to argue for equality under the law. We don't want anybody to change their language. We don't want anybody to make up stories to lie to children. We don't want a complete change in the values of society. We simply asked for equality under the law. I personally still believe that I don't, I don't actually mind if somebody says, I'm not keen on homosexuality. I don't think it's a good thing. I can live with that because I will say to them, well, that's over to you. But do you believe that I'm entitled to the same treatment under the law as anybody else? And if they say yes, then we can part. We disagree on some things, but the fundamental issue is everybody deserves equality under the law. Sorry, go on. Sorry to, to yeah. jump in here. I, yeah. I'm just really curious how it felt to be a lesbian at that time. How was society, how was the acceptance uh, legally? What was the thing that you needed to achieve and how could you argue and how, what arguments were successful besides this? 
um, that, you know, you just talk to an average person and say, look, I don't care mm. what you think about me. I just want equal treatment, basically. Yeah. yeah, that was it in a nutshell. I think we saw the most incredible changes under the Labour government of Tony Blair. I think I'm right in saying that he invited Ian McKellen to go and see him in Downing Street soon after he was elected and sat Ian down and said, what do you want? And um, I gather Ian, I think, said four things. I think he said we want um, the ban on gays in the military lifted. I think he said that we wanted civil partnership or the ability to marriage. I think he mentioned the right to adopt children. And the fourth thing escapes me. Um, but these were fundamental areas of law where we did not have the same rights. And I think there was a sense of new beginnings in 1997 when Tony Blair was elected. And there was a famous song called um, uh, Things Are Going to Get Better. And I think, as, you know, to be perfectly honest, for me, my life as a lesbian since the 70s until 2015 in the United Kingdom and in New Zealand, were fabulous. You know, it's very, very wrong, I think, for charities today that say they represent LGBTQIA plus people to focus on us as victims. I have never felt a victim. I, I never intend to be a victim, although I'm pretty fed up at the moment with the way I'm being treated with the new homophobia. But up until 2015, uh, you know, of course, horrible things happened in isolated incidents with prejudiced people who may have spat at me or called me names or. But, you know, life is not straightforward. And if you can't deal with things when they happen to you, then you have got a problem with your own self-esteem and you need to find some better friends to help you to get over that sort of thing. I'm not going to sit around and pretend I'm a victim when I look at women around the world and lesbians around the world who are being correctively raped or who are being beaten up or who have female babies who are thrown on rubbish dumps. We were so lucky in this country. And then in 2015, under the influence of Stonewall and uh, other groups, there's a particular one called Press for Change um, that decided to go under the radar and push forward their ideas on gender ideology theory, gender identity theory. Um, uh, up until 2015, we lived in a very tolerant world. I actually still think most people in the UK are tolerant, but a huge number have been misled because Stonewall has swerved. Everybody trusted Stonewall completely. Governments, public services, universities, even overseas governments would, would look to Stonewall as an example of best practice in campaigning with integrity. And that was trashed in 2015. So what happens in 2015? And, and the reason I'm really interested in this uh, year uh, itself, because that's when I noticed a shift in Hungary. And that's what I hear from in other interviews about the topic. Everybody kind of puts uh, in the mid 2010s, they uh, put the shift around that time. So it, it feels like a global phenomenon that happens. And these organizations have a big part of it. So inside Stonewall, uh, what did you notice first? I knew that in America, a T had appeared from nowhere in the grouping LGB. Um, when we first started campaigning, and by the way, it was long before the Stonewall Inn riots, long before that, decades before, our friend Fred Sargent, who is um, lives now in New England, who was at Stonewall in that night. At um, the riots? Yes. Right. <clears throat> He's a, a big friend of LGB Alliance and describes us as the natural successors of the lesbian and gay and bisexual rights movement in the US. Um, but he talks about what happened in the decades prior to that, which is very interesting. And we've got a video on our YouTube channel of Bev interviewing Fred Sargent. I encourage anyone who's interested in our history to have a look at that. But I understand that at the end of the 90s, T came along and the acronym became LGBT. Now, in Stonewall's materials and in the UK, 
it was still LGB. And this is one of the huge ironies of the way people describe us as being a hate group because we have removed the T. And I have to say to you, uh, we have a word in English called whippersnapper. <laughs> I have no idea what the Hungarian equivalent is. But a whippersnapper is something like an annoying little puppy. <laughs> so we have annoying little puppies who come up to us and say, you've taken the tea off LGB. And we say, listen, whippersnapper, <laughs> you don't know what you're talking about. The tea came from nowhere and was slapped on. Um, what happened in the particular case of Stonewall was that every legal battle had been won. We were in a wonderful position legally in this country. So you managed to overturn these uh, legal inequalities that yes. were in the legal system. Yes, yes. Gay marriage was uh, achieved and all these other... All of them. Mm -hmm. We have one little tiny one left, which is an inequality in pensions. And we're trying to get a small piece of legislation passed on that. But that's a, a minor issue. The big issues were sorted. So then you say to yourself, okay, we've got a wonderful organization here called Stonewall. We've got fantastic supporters. We've got a lot of credibility. What shall we do? And if you look around the world and you see that 69 countries still make homosexuality illegal, and if you realize that the vast proportion of those are Commonwealth countries, there's a strong argument to say, I know, let's help our brothers and sisters overseas in whatever way we can. Um, and I know someone who was actually at a meeting with, I believe it was the financial director or fundraising director of Stonewall, with other charities at that time. And they were asked, what, what next for Stonewall? And apparently the answer was, well, we're weighing up whether to go international to see how we can support in the best way homosexuals around the globe, or should we adopt the T? Wow, this yeah. was so explicit. Yes, mm. yes. Now, I knew Ruth Hunt, who became Chief Executive Officer of Stonewall. When I was working at American Express, I was responsible for, for raising funds from American Express to sponsor some annual events. So I think we spent 20,000 a year or 30,000 a year on sponsoring a big fundraising walk in Brighton because American Express has a big office in Brighton. It all made perfect sense. Stonewall, Brighton, American Express, me. Um, and Ruth Hunt was one of the people who used to come and see me at Amex. So I knew her. And she decided to stand to be chief executive. And I supported her. I'm sorry. I apologize, everybody who's listening. I supported her. I even arranged um, a drinks evening for her to come and meet lots of my lesbian friends so that we would all lobby for her on Twitter and elsewhere and say, support Ruth Hunt as the next chief executive officer of Stonewall. What a hideous mistake I made. We asked Ruth Hunt directly, if we support you, will you guarantee that you do not add the T? Will you guarantee that you will go in the direction of seeing how we can support our brothers and sisters worldwide? And she gave us her word. Later, it transpired that she hired a consultant, uh, who's now her partner, Ruth Ellis, to come into Stonewall and to set up focus groups, not with us, not with the lesbians, not with the gays, but with the people who supported gender identity ideology. And out of that has come eight years of hell in this country, an unknown number of destroyed lives of young children who are gender non-conforming, women particularly, but some men who've lost their jobs because they have spoken against Stonewall law. And the damage that has been wreaked is immeasurable. And I find that unforgivable. So a lot of Hungarians will listen to this and think that you are describing something unreal because in Hungary we just simply don't have the space we this is not true we have the space to debate this but we won't and we don't have I think enough information enough platforms that would uh, critically uh, touch the subject of gender identity or uh, the government does touch it but with a sledgehammer and in a very um, 
destructive way for everyone. But basically, I think it, it's important for us to understand what happened here exactly since 2015 and what you mean when you say so many lives have been destroyed. So what, what has happened? And also, I think it would be useful to give a sense of how it looked like on the ground that the T was added in quotes, because people will say, well, but surely there were, uh, you know, trans people in this, in these friends groups and communities, and they were always around. And we, we knew transsexuals from back in the day, and it was all peaceful and lovely and a wonderful, happy, big family. I think it would be good to walk us through this, how it looked like for an average person who looks at this. Mm. For an average person looking at it, I think what happened was one of two things. One was, oh, here's another group of poor people. We were really nasty to the gays and the lesbians and the bisexuals. That was a mistake. Now, somebody like Theresa May, for example, who is our prime minister, who I'm sure has every good intention in the world, and knows zero zip zilch <laughs> about issues of sex and gender because she's trying to concentrate on her political imperatives. She, I would argue, represents, and, and some of her team, represent the people who thought they were being kind. And they looked back at maybe we hadn't been quite as quick as we should have been to be nice to the L's and the G's and the B's. So let's not make that mistake again. Let's embrace the T's. We don't know what it means. We've got no clue, but it looks like they're the same as the LGBs. So let's wrap them all up in a great big hug. And apparently the LGB, formerly LGB organizations, embrace them. So why would we not, right? Exactly. So Stonewall... Gendered Intelligence is another group that flies a little bit lower under the radar, but again has wreaked havoc in this country. Uh, I mean, th what happened was that group after group after group sprung up, modelling itself on Stonewall and LGBT. I think, honestly, I've got to confess, I was, to begin with, I thought, well, I don't know. What, what, why, you know is this going to work? Is it? I'm not sure about this. What is going on? And... I just thought it was a, it was wrong to put them together because they're two completely different things. But I had no clue what the T had hidden behind it. Right. And when you say completely different things, you mean sexual orientation and gender identity or transgender? Yeah. Let me summarize. I'm going to say this phrase because I really like saying it. As I said in the House of Lords a few weeks ago... <laughs> <laughs> For anyone in Hungary who doesn't know, we have a two-chamber system, the House of Commons and the House of Lords. And of course, I wasn't speaking in the House of Lords itself, but I was in a meeting room. And I was just pointing out that, you know, I was looking around the room and I was saying, there's lots of lesbians, gays, bisexuals in this room. I like some of you. I may not like others of you. The only thing we have in common is our sexual orientation, We don't share cult beliefs. We don't all belong to the same religion. But the T, which we didn't know at the beginning, Stonewall made it clear that the T didn't just mean people who had undergone surgery and hormones to change their body, to try to live in an outward appearance of the opposite sex. We didn't know that this was T meant an entire global ideology that ultimately erases women and destroys the very concept of homosexuality. So it took us a while. I mean, I, I remember sort of bumping into Ruth Hunt at some social event and saying, Ruth, you know, you're not going to do this. This is after she was CEO. You're not going to go ahead with this. I, oh, yeah, yeah, it's all going well. And then gradually I got more and more worried because what I could see was lies. And up until then, Stonewall had not lied Stonewall had told the truth. And as I got more worried, I tried to gather around me um, former trustees of Stonewall. Um, and in fact, one of the founders, um, Simon Fanshaw. So over a period of about three years, we had meetings um, 
about what were we going to do. And what held us back for so long was we can't attack Stonewall. We can't attack Stonewall. These are our people. Um, and in fact, many of the former trustees who I was working with at that time, when we did come, when we did come to the point of saying, we are now going to form our own organisation, couldn't do it. They couldn't do it because so many people's lives were so wrapped up in, in, in Stonewall and the work we'd done, the blood, sweat and tears. Not me, because I, I must admit, I was uh, on the periphery. I never worked for them. I just raised the money and did my best to, to promote them. But many of the trustees had given, you know, so much of their time, so much of their energy, so much of their blood, sweat and tears. And here we were, not only criticising Stonewall, but saying Stonewall must go. Yeah. So it was a very emotional time, but I wrote... Over a period of three years, we had two letters to the Sunday Times, which is our biggest selling paper on a Sunday, I think. Um, and um, we had a petition with 10,000 signatures. All the petition asked for was we asked Stonewall to engage in a dialogue. That's all it was. And unusually, we got about a third of the people who signed that petition also left comments and by and large, they were former Stonewall supporters saying, you have gone crazy. You are letting us down. We must have a dialogue. Because part of Stonewall's move towards the promotion of gender identity theory was no debate. If you debate, you are killing me. You know, it's like... So, again, over those three years, I wrote to Jan Gooding, the chair of trustees, asking directly for a meeting between current trustees former trustees. We went to and fro, always excuses. In the end, I offered to have a, what do you call it, when you have a mediator between the two groups. I thought, okay, well, if Jan is too scared to do it, let's have an independent mediator. Let's just sit down privately and talk this out. And she went berserk about that because I had taken the liberty of finding a mediator who knew nothing about this subject and who said agreed she would do it so at the end of that period I was getting to my wits end and somebody introduced me to Bev Jackson in 2019 I must just point out Bev Jackson was a founding member she says she wasn't a founder she was a founding member of Gay Liberation Front in London she was a student at LSE in 1970 saw a sign about something to do with gay liberation and thought, oh, that looks interesting. I went along and found she was the only woman in a meeting of sort of a dozen people, men. Off they went on their first demo and she gave a quote to the Times, which is, you could still see it. She said, we are not ashamed to be homosexual. Now, Bev Jackson was saying that in 1970. She's saying it again in 2023. And unfortunately, uh, we have been forced to fight the original battles over again. Yeah, so we met and we just talked and talked, 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 talked. My background, Stonewall, her background, GLF. My background also, women's liberation, which was different from hers. And eventually we said, well, we're, we're going to do something. We don't know what will happen. You know, hopefully if we get people together... Some other people who are perhaps a little younger than us <laughs> and maybe richer than us <laughs> might take this forward. So we contacted loads of uh, people on Twitter. And here's another word for Hungarian listeners may not be familiar with. Stroppy. <laughs> I was asked about this by Mr. Gibbon, who was at the time the QC, in, uh, cross-examining me in our trial. What did you mean by stroppy, Miss Harris? Well, Mr. Gibbon, I meant people who were very difficult and stubborn and wouldn't give up. <laughs> so that's what we were looking for across Twitter. And we phoned each person individually, told them we were having a meeting, what it was about, would they come. We also spoke to radical feminist separatists who we knew wouldn't come because we wanted to tell them, what we were doing and why we were doing it. Um, we wanted to explain that we believe that every single person who fights against gender identity ideology for freedom of speech and against the medicalization of children 
Every single person has a role in that, whether they are a radical feminist separatist, whether they're straight, whether they're gay, trans, bisexual, lesbian, everybody who's against that, we will support them to fight it in whatever way we can. But for us, we decided that the way for our organisation to be taken seriously was to be uh, a gay, lesbian and bisexual organisation that would reflect the very best of what Stonewall used to be. Fact-based, integrity, reliability, transparency. So we did a lot of phoning and we got support from everybody, everybody. Um, then we had our meeting on the 22nd of October 2019. It was secret and it was so funny because we had security, we didn't need it. And when the people came into the meeting, lots of them said, oh, here <laughs> I'm so pleased I couldn't tell anybody <laughs> and it was just this fabulous feeling of togetherness that we used to have when gays lesers and bisexuals got together and we had trans people there and we had somebody who's has disorders of sexual development and we had straight people you know our battle is it's an intellectual battle of course it comes from the heart but our end goal is to stop the lives of children being destroyed. And so we welcome anyone who supports us in that struggle. We always have, we always will, and that's in our charitable objects, that um, that those, our goals, include anybody who supports what we've got in our mission statement. So what happens to gays, lesbians, and bisexuals, and children, and women here, Because I don't think people realize how far it's gone in the UK. I mean, there's a reason it's called Turf Island as well. Um, but so this ideology, gender identity ideology, really has a hold on all institutions here. What is the result of this in people's lives, especially, of course, homosexuals' lives and women's lives? Okay. For lesbians, it means we're not allowed to meet without the risk of disruption. Same in Australia, the state of Victoria, you will have seen probably. Um, in Australia, it's even worse. The definition of sex was removed from the statute book decades ago. So they're in an even worse position. For lesbians here, we are told that we are transphobic, anti-Semitic, even racist. If we're not open to having sex, with men who call themselves lesbians. How does anti-Semitism come? Just for a second, I don't okay. understand. Okay, it's, let me explain it to you. This came from Nancy Kelly, who followed Ruth Hunt into the role of chief exec at Stonewall. And what she was saying is that there are prejudices that people have that can be unlearned, such as anti-Semitism and racism. And not wanting to sleep with men is a prejudice that us lesbians need to unlearn. But For those listeners who, you know, find their, they can't believe this, let me just tell you, I hope you've all heard of Alison Bailey. Alison Bailey is famous, A, because she launched LGB Alliance long before we were ready to be launched, <laughs> in a famous tweet on the 22nd of October, just before midnight, 2019, and she said, watch out world, LGB Alliance is here. And suddenly all hell broke loose. We were planning to make an announcement in about three months when we were ready. Thank you, Alison. She's also famous because she's one of the gutsiest campaigners I've ever met. She's a barrister and she took both her chambers and Stonewall to court. That case is continuing. Um, anyway, Alison had a terribly long trial. Uh, we were all allowed to watch it online. I think it must have been during covid And um, we, we have a thing in the UK called the bar. Do you have that in Hungary? It represents all the lawyers, the barristers. And there are rules associated with the bar. And there are bar standards. And one of the witnesses, whose name escapes me, was a senior person in charge of bar standards. So very senior in the legal profession. And she was cross-examined because she believed that lesbians like Alison or me or Bev or any other lesbian who is unwilling to be open to having sex with men who identifies as women can be compared to 
white South Africans who, after the end of apartheid, refused to mix with black people. Oh, my God. And then Alison had to, I think, go through this insane trial. And I think she left the bar at the end. And she's a black lesbian campaigner and yep. barrister. And, and she's coming back because she's appealing. She won against her chambers. She didn't win against Stonewall. And she's coming back and appealing that. So I encourage everyone who's listening, keep your eyes peeled because that will be coming up probably, I suppose, I don't know, but I suppose in, in 2024. And I hope to God she wins because she has been treated abominably by Stonewall, of all people. And um, you were in the middle of explaining what happens to lesbians and women right oh, yes. now. Yeah, let me go on about that. So basically, socially, lesbians are going underground. Same thing's happening with gay men. They're going underground. We have, uh, and again, you may be surprised by this, the NHS, which is our publicly funded health organization, which is the biggest employer in Europe. This costs us all a huge amount, billions, this NHS. The NHS has published a guide for trans men. And in case you're confused as to what that means, because I was confused for years, a trans man is very often a gender non-conforming woman who would normally have become a lesbian. Anyway, the NHS published a guide to help trans men have sex in gay men's clubs and saunas without letting on that they're female. So this is the state we're in. Um, gay men can be entrapped into having sex with a woman that they don't want to have because these poor young women have been encouraged by the NHS to cover up the fact that they're female in order to have sexual encounters with gay men. I find that utterly immoral in so many ways. And last year, LGB Alliance had a very interesting and enjoyable three-city tour called Lesbian Not Criminal. And this was with Tonya Jevon from Norway, who was charged with criminal offences because she said a man was a man. We had a wonderful tour and it was lesbians only and it was in Edinburgh, Cardiff and London. So we're a tiny organisation, but we, we have big ambitions and we intend to host more events that are for gay men only or for lesbians only uh, or for bisexuals. I mean, we all want to be mixed up, but we also want our own separate events. But this is not allowed in Britain today. And this used to be such a normal thing. Even in Hungary, I remember there were the organizations, of course, for everyone, but lesbians had their own events and then gay men had their own events and parties and venues. And then uh, there were events for trans people and it was all fine. Nobody was attacking the other just for, just for meeting up with their groups. Mm -hmm. And speaking of attacks, I really want to talk about the Mermaid story because oh, yes. uh, Mermaid is a British charity uh, advocating for trans gender youth mm -hmm. um, and they attempted to strip LGBT alliance of its charitable status mm -hmm. saying that you are an anti-trans group I guess mm -hmm. um, so what, what happened and what was the result of this let's be very clear Stonewall was involved in this as well we know that because the first we heard about this was Twitter And uh, a tweet came out which included Stonewall in the list of charities who were going to take us to court. Um, let me just explain. Uh, we set up in 2019. Uh, as I said, we were launched rather prematurely, but we applied for charitable status. With it. I started work on that application in March 2020. It took a year of extremely detailed work with a firm of lawyers who were experts who helped us. And we based our charitable application on the terms of reference used by Stonewall. So about human rights, but about prioritizing LGB. Uh, we won our charitable status in April 2021. And within minutes, there were petitions calling for us to lose our charitable status. It's not just Stonewall, Mermaids, Gendered Intelligence, Jerez. It's LGBT Consortium, LGBT Foundation, and hundreds of others signed petitions. And these are all not, not just LGBTQIA charities, but also people like Amnesty, Liberty, 
Oxfam, all these other um, charities who have all drunk the same Kool-Aid. They all swim in the same tank. They all change jobs. They all serve on each other's boards. So there was a huge, huge wave of, of um, fury that we could possibly have been given charitable status. And all credit to the Charity Commission, who put out the longest statement they ever had about why they gave us charitable status. And they also had to hire additional people to take all the calls and answer all the complaints about us getting charitable status. So Mermaids was the figurehead. There's um, a lawyer in this country whose name I won't mention, but he runs a project which has become a joke. Um, its name is the Good Law Project. It, most people call it the Poor Loss Project now because he loses over and over again. He takes the government to court every five minutes. It's a multi-million pound industry for him because poor, unsuspecting members of the public send him money to try and run all these cases. And we think um, he was directly involved in persuading mermaids to be the figurehead for this case. So, yeah, we heard about it on Twitter and mermaids said that we were not fit because we didn't comply with the requirements to be a charity and we didn't fulfill our charitable objects. Um, in brief, they took the case, the appeal was to the charity commission. We weren't involved. So we took legal advice and the legal advisors said, well, if mermaids take their case to the charity commission, all the evidence will come from mermaids and none from anybody else because the charity commission didn't want to give evidence themselves. They wanted to stay neutral. So in the end, we raised, we we still have £50,000 to raise. If anybody has a checkbook handy, please look at our website. Actually, we have a crowd justice funder that still shows a 50000 deficit. Anyway, a quarter of a million pounds is what it cost. What? Yeah, it cost, I mean, in terms of the personal cost of, of time and effort and stress and horrors of being cross-examined and and you know I, I, this is not my world I've never been in court before but you have to you have to write witness statements you have to do hundreds and hundreds of pages of evidence anyway the best thing is we won mermaids and stonewall and the poor loss project and every single charity that still cries that we shouldn't have charitable status you can go and run away and sob in a corner because we won the case and what and, and i mean it's it's one thing that all these charities don't agree with you fine but what is it about this um this subject that drives people to attack you that really they they actually go and take legal actions and they go until they can to make your uh, work impossible i'm obsessed with with that question why why i mean i've met face to face some of our most ardent critics some refuse to speak and will turn their back on me and walk away some will say We hate you because you are a far right wing Trump supporting bigot who is in receipt of multi million pounds from US evangelicals. And they go on to say rather misogynistic things, such as, unless you were in receipt of multi million pounds from US evangelicals, you silly old lesbians couldn't possibly be putting conferences on at the QE2 Center and you silly old lesbians and gay men and bisexuals couldn't possibly have started a charity that's now been going for years and continues to grow. So there's a massive amount of homophobia and misogyny. They don't think that we could have done it and they don't believe that homosexuals and bisexuals in this country and straight people and trans people, they don't believe that grassroots supporters give us five pounds a month and that's what keeps us going because in their world, they could never do that. And they don't believe that people have common sense, I guess. Uh, and let's talk about the, the homophobia that's coming from inside the house, I guess. Uh, I mean, it's, uh, it's just wild. Even in Hungary, the kind of response you get, if you even just scratch the surface of this topic in a critical way, And I really want to talk about the role of lesbians in all this in your organization and, and in just in general in this movement, because I think lesbians 
were the first to notice the really awful um, consequences of this ideology, gender identity ide ideology. There are so many lesbians coming out as trans men, these influencers who we used to look up to as like are you know the lesbian heroes of us uh, in sitcoms in in the from the U.S. to everywhere? Lesbians don't want to use the word lesbian anymore. They they are claiming to be okay with men who say they are women to date them. By the way, I don't believe this, but they would say things like that. Um, they are being medicalized young women who are gender non-conforming, basically tomboys, uh, if they say they are uncomfortable. Butch lesbians are, I don't know where they are. I think they had to disappear or, or I don't know. And lesbian spaces disappeared. And yes, as you said, in their um, communities, in their dating, they cannot ignore this topic. Like I remember when I used to date, um, when I first started dating women, and, and I remember there could not be a date without mentioning this first or making a statement And I remember thinking, this is ridiculous. Like, we don't even have trans people in our circles. But we have to make a declaration to each other, a political declaration for some reason, in our intimate lives. This is in our bedrooms. Um, this is in our friends' groups. We lose friends over this shit. It's just so wild what happens to women, especially lesbians. So I, I really want your take on this and what you experienced. Mm. My experience is that we've had some extraordinarily brave and loyal gay men supporters. But by and large, we've been let down by gay men. And I, I'm sorry to say that because those who have supported us have been so creative, so loving, so loyal, and we would not be where we are without them. But by and large... I think a lot of gay men have found this too difficult. They don't want to get involved, even though they know it's a problem. I hope that's changing. Um, but we were expecting, to be perfectly honest, we were expecting much more support, particularly financial support, from wealthy gay men who in the past supported Stonewall. With honourable exceptions, we've been um, disappointed. The other side of the coin, as uh, let me say for the third time, and to all you wonderful gay men <laughs> and straight men and bisexual men who have supported us, we love you and we thank you because your support is rare and it's more important for its rarity. Um, in terms of lesbians, all I can say is thank God for the strength and the sisterhood of lesbians around the world. I can also say that it utterly, utterly appalls us to see what you've described, the disappearance of tomboys, little girls coming up to us at conferences or meetings who are spouting word for word what they have been taught in school or at university about gender identity theory. It is wicked. It is disgraceful. I am so grateful that I was born in 1954. Um, I just think that every single lesbian who has a brain and has a heart needs to join the fight. And I am appalled and disgusted by every single lesbian who has abandoned what she knows to be true. Um, I, 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 I cannot understand that, but I do want to say on a positive note, with LGB Alliance, we have wonderful lesbian chair, wonderful lesbian chief executive. We've got loads and loads of lesbian supporters. We've got brilliant gay men, bisexual supporters. And it's so funny because our opponents say, of course, they're all straight white men. And, uh, you know, I just look around and... <laughs> It's just, it is just a joke. But you know what? Lesbians need, we've always been powerful. We've always been more creative. We've always had to be extremely independent. And we've always had to find ways around things to have fun. But don't we have fun? You know, there's nothing, nothing, nothing that beats a group of lesbians going out 
having a good night out. And I'm sorry, boys, we do love you and we do love the mixed parties as well. But you cannot beat lesbian night out. You're so right. That That is so true. And I have I have to add about gay men that some of the most vicious attacks I get uh, in Hungary are from gay men. It, it puzzles me because they don't have a dog in this fight. Uh, in Hungary, they don't they they don't feel the effects of this. Lesbians do, mm. but mostly people just don't care. Even homosexuals just don't care, uh, which is mind boggling to me. I also think that gay men uh, just don't give a shit about women when it comes down to really our our spaces and our rights and our freedoms. Um, and we also don't have a, a good history in Hungary of mm. um, community based grassroots resistance. Um, we do have really great organizations, um, but we don't have any uh, organization that would go against mm. uh, this ideology. And in Hungary, of course, it's it's um, also topped with um, because we have Orban uh, and his government in power. Mm. You are sil- You are double silenced. Because as soon as you speak out, you're, of course, um, you're a supporter of Orban and the government. And this is a time for solidarity. We can't be divided. This is the mantra. We cannot, we have to pull together. All these minority groups who are oppressed have to pull together. And you can't be, you cannot really beat this argument. Um, So if you're critical, you're basically, of course, a Nazi and a, I don't know, Orban supporter. So it's... uh, it's really, really good to hear all this from you because I think it gives us a picture of where where is this coming from and what's ahead. Mm. Uh, because we're importing everything wholesale. Like mm. the, this ideology, I guess, is a U.S. import to here too, mm. in, in a way. And we also look to the so-called West and we import the good and the bad, of course. Um, we also imported a lot of the great achievements of the women's liberation. So, um, Yeah, I think we're very lucky that we... We have got a history of gay men and lesbians working together and and laughing at each other and taking the piss and arguing. But but we've always, I mean, through the AIDS crisis, there was certainly an awful lot of um, lesbians involved helping during that appalling time. And And, you know, we've sort of rubbed along, knowing that we're different, but knowing that we've got a lot in common which is which is great and i can think of it's it's quite funny for me having started lgp alliance i've actually met far more gay men than i ever knew before and believe it or not trans people um and straight people i mean i've just met i mean it's, it sounds a bit silly but i've met a, a bigger variety because my life tended to be sort of work or <laughs> lesbians <laughs> on the whole as it were i think When I speak to gay men and lesbians about what what actually flips us, what actually peak transes us, if you like, and it should be peak trans ideology because I think, you know, trans people and trans ideology are two different things. But the point is, if you say to a gay man where you bullied at school, nine out of ten, they will say, of course I was. And how did you stop being bullied at school? I went through puberty. I grew muscles, I was taller than them, I could fight back. And then if you talk about puberty blockers and what that does, and then hormones, and then I think whether you are gay or lesbian, that is the heart of the matter. And that's why our flagship project, I mean, yes, we've always been for freedom of speech, protecting the rights of gays and lesbians but and bisexuals, but fundamentally... We've been against telling children the lie of gender identity. Telling children you can change sex is a wicked lie and an unnecessary lie. So we've always wanted to set up a helpline. And what the helpline will be will be the only LGB helpline in the United Kingdom. What do we mean by LGB helpline? We mean a helpline that is entirely staffed by people who have experienced what it's like to grow up as a lesbian or a gay man, and any child can ring up and say, I think I'm a boy, or I think I'm a girl, and this will be a a listening service, this will be online, not just phone, you know, um, it it has to be 
you know, high tech, etc., etc., etc. That's always been our flagship project. We've been delayed by two years because of our court case, but this has been written into our sort of business plan since 2020. We're very late with it. We hope it'll start Q1 2024. Uh, this is how I think we can bring in more gay men and indeed more lesbians. What was it like growing up? Did you need to talk to somebody? No kid growing up now, I think, can grow up without being confused in this country because the vast majority of our schools, I hope it's not the same in Hungary, from the age of five, you are taught that you have a gender identity that may be different from the body in which you were born. You know, brain confused. Apparently our brains don't stop developing till we're 25. So is it any surprise that these children are thinking, who am I? What am I? Is it any surprise that teenage girls getting sent dick pics and goodness knows what think, I don't want to be a girl. I don't want to be flooded with porn. I'll be a boy because that's really nice and easy. So I think there's sort of two angles to the helpline. One is that we hope it will be make it clear to, to gays and lesbians and bisexuals who haven't supported us before. Support us because in supporting us, you're supporting children. And children are the sharp end. We see the children as collateral damage of a, I, I do use the word, a wicked ideology. Our time is up soon, but I do want to ask one last question because... Sure. I found it really interesting when you said in an interview that it's not just gay rights or women's rights or children's uh, safety and health, but it's it's the values of liberal democracy and the in, enlightenment, enlightenment yes. in danger. And yes. I thought that was really important. Uh, so uh, if you could just elaborate on that. Yes. This is more and more important in the world. <laughs> you look around and... A liberal democracy depends on the ability to disagree and still to work together. Now, if you disagree and can't work together, what is the alternative? The alternative is violence and war. So I am obsessed with supporting the idea of a liberal democracy because I can't see anything better than that anywhere in the world. The values of the Enlightenment inform liberal democracy. So it's science, it's, it's reasoned dialogue, it's thinking things through. And above all, it's we have to be able to disagree. I want people to challenge what I'm thinking because that makes what I'm thinking clearer to me. Am I right? Am I wrong? Have I misunderstood this? So for a healthy world, our health in every way, I think, depends on being able to have reasoned dialogue. So to me, uh, you know, people say, oh, this is a niche fight. You know, this is this is between the QTIAs and the LGBTs. Hello, this is a global issue. It's not going to go away. And we need it to end in a way that is good for everybody. And by that, I mean healthy democracies in as many countries as as can possibly be. I think that's so important. And the, and the message that you previously said uh, also to grow your resilience and to be able to argue and to and to face up to uh, arguments against your argument instead of the no debate policy. Exactly. Yep. Because, yeah, we know from these uh, liberation movements that if you sugarcoat everything and infantilize everything, that's the other thing that bl blows my mind. It's just the whole... LGBTQI rainbow uh, community and everything is in unicorns and glitter. I'm like, where where are the adults? Mm. Where are the adults? We are the adults in the room. And every LGB alliance group around the world is providing an adult perspective on what I hope is a temporary insanity. Let's hope. Thank you so much for talking to me. It's great to be here. Thank you so much for having me.